during the school years, but what happens after? Barbara Aerosmith Young has pioneered a technique that teaches students to exercise the parts of their brains that don't work properly. Young is living proof it can work. As a child, she was so severely learning disabled, she was called retarded. Now, she's the head of her own school, and her teaching method is in demand. Tonight, Barbara Aerosmith Young is our profile on Person to Person. Barbara Aerosmith Young has been researching for most of her life. She's trying to figure out why some kids have trouble reading and some don't. And the answers mean even more to her because she suffered a severe learning disability as a child. She seemed happy growing up in a large middle class family, but inside, Barbara struggled to understand the logic behind simple day-to-day -day tasks. She could barely read, write, even think. Throughout high school, she used a phenomenal memory to just get by. But it wasn't until she made it all the way to graduate school that she made the discoveries for which people now call her a genius. This is a normal brain reading out loud. This is eye tracking sounding out words, visual memory for words, meaning, and articulation. If a child has difficulty in two or more areas, they're going to have trouble learning how to read. Okay. Now, Young assesses children with learning disabilities at her school. There, they learn the Aerosmith method. Young created specific brain exercises that target areas of the brain that aren't functioning. What look like strange exercises seem to actually awaken once dormant areas. So I try that again. She says her learning disabilities are cured. No red outside of one. Excellent. But Barbara's decades of research and groundbreaking discoveries came with a personal price. I spoke with her at her apartment in West End, Toronto. I think probably um, when I started uh, kindergarten, um, even at that early age, I just really didn't like school um, and certainly when I got into grade one and had difficulty reading that's when it, it really hit home and also learning to write writing everything backwards um, it, it was uh, you it was wrote very backwards. hard I wrote everything backwards um, so I, I wrote backwards I read backwards um, I wrote my numbers backwards so it, it was complete mirror writing and then not only did I write backwards, but because starting from the wrong side, my hand would, would smear across the, the paper, so the teacher thought not only was I writing incorrectly, I was making a mess of what I was doing. Um, and, and so she gave me a lot of grief as a result of that and put me in the Turtles reading group, which I knew obviously was uh, not the reading group that one wanted to be in. So it, it, it started uh, pretty early. Did you realize that that's what was going on, though, at such a young age? Did you realize, uh, oh, I'm not learning the way others learn, or did you simply think there's something horribly wrong with me? I thought there was something horribly wrong with me, and I thought, uh, I mean, the word that would come into my mind was that I'm stupid or that I'm dumb um, because everybody else is getting it and they can write the correct way, they can read the words correctly, and I couldn't. So, um, and then feeling that, that somehow I had to cover it up. So, um, just this, this horrible feeling of that, that I was a fake and a fraud and, and stupid. So, tell me about the rest of school. Uh, it's, it was bad right from kindergarten. Mm -hmm. how, how, what happened? Well, eventually I did learn how to read and write in the correct order. Um, the, the grade one teacher spoke to my parents and said that uh, how she described it was a mental block because they didn't have at that time uh, the concept of learning disabilities. And she told my parents that I wouldn't learn the way uh, other children did and so that they needed to get me flashcards. And eventually I learned tricks just like other kids do where my mom would hold up like the one plus one flashcard that the answer to was on the back 
back, and so she held it up by the window. Um, I could see the two on the back until eventually she caught on that I wasn't figuring it out. I was just reading the number on the back, so then she put her thumb over that, and, and uh, so eventually... <laughs> I did have to learn them, but it, it, even when I did learn it, it, um, it didn't stick. So it, it just took tremendous effort. It must have been a huge secret to carry around, especially for such a young person. It, it was, and, and like I just had to work so, so hard to not even, like just to barely keep up like it used to feel almost like I was holding on with the ends of my fingernails on a cliff and never being certain whether I had enough energy to, to keep holding on or whether I was going to fall and feeling like there was nobody there if I did fall to catch me so I think if a person was in that position you would begin to question what the point of it all was did you? I did. I did. Um, there was. Uh, there were a couple of different points where I felt like it was just too much of a burden to go on, and uh, did seriously think about ending my life. One, I think, when I was about thirteen, and, and uh, school was just. I mean, going into high school, um, more subjects that expected understanding. I mean, mathematics getting more complicated, getting into the sciences, um, just feeling like I couldn't hold it all together um, and, and made an attempt at, at that point. Um, it, was, it was rather pathetic, but <laughs> I did didn't know do? it. I took a razor blade and, and just made two little nicks in, in my wrists. And in, in my limited understanding, I thought, well, you just go to bed and you don't wake up in the morning. Um, and obviously, I did wake up in the morning. Um, I mean, when I woke up the next morning, I thought, well, I can't even do this right. And at times, I thought maybe I was crazy because I could see that other people could do things seemingly with very little effort that no matter how hard I tried, I couldn't do it the way they could do it. Um, so it, it, it uh, was kind of like a life of, I guess, quiet desperation. What are the saddest moments for you when you think about them? Um, I think the saddest moments would be when I was getting ready to study for exams. Um, and, and my routine was I, I would go, as I said, either down to the laundry room and cry and pull up my hair or go up to my bedroom. I'd put all my books out on my bed. And I would just, I'd cry my heart out. Um, and I, I, I think, if I think about it now, it's like I, I drained myself of all emotion. And then I would just memorize everything. Like I, I would start with um, the first page in my book, and I had this whole process where I would memorize the first three sentences, make sure I got that, then memorize the next three sentences and chunk them to the first three. And I would keep going until I could look at the first sentence in my book, and then I could just say everything that was in the book from one end to the next. I imagine you finished high school by memorizing everything, but I, the mind baffles thinking about you going on to university. How did you do that? Well, I, had, I did have a phenomenal uh, both visual and auditory memory. In fact, to the point that if there was a newscast at 6 o'clock, the same newscast was repeated at 11, I could say it verbatim. Um, so that's phenomenal. Yes. Um, so again, whether I'd always had it or whether I developed it to compensate, I'm not exactly sure. But um, so I could sit in a lecture and I could memorize what was being said um, and and close to photographic memory. So I could memorize the the textbook. So in a lot of classes in university, you can get by. Um, by memorizing the text, so because there's a lot of multiple choice, um, so that's that's how I got through. So you did your first memory. degree in? Uh, it was a Bachelor of Applied Science in Child Studies. Why do you think you, you decided to study that? Were you looking for answers? Oh, I think definitely that I was looking for answers. I was, uh, in my own way, trying to understand what um, wasn't working with me, and so as a result of that, ended up doing my master's degree in school psychology, which is the assessment of people that are having difficulties. So again, it was um, specifically my search for a solution to my difficulty. 
But the traditional explanations weren't very helpful. When did you start to just sort of pull up the edge of the page to get to what was really happening with you? Well, it was in, in graduate school, after I'd gone to my professors and described the kind of difficulties I was having and told that, that I couldn't really be having those difficulties because if I was, I couldn't be passing. And the fact that I was managing to get A's, um, they dismissed it. They said, well, you, you can't be learning disabled. Um, and so I felt like, so this is the first time that I'm going out and publicly admitting it and not getting um, uh, a response uh, that um, that was a time when I really thought about um, jumping in front of a subway train and I had it all planned as to you know where you know I would need to stand for the most impact and and I'm not sure you know why I didn't do it but I didn't I guess around that time became aware of the, the two lines of research that led me to the work that I'm doing now. That eventually led you to understanding what about yourself? Well, understanding that it was a specific deficit area um, and that maybe there was something that I could do about it. And at that time, I met my ex-husband, and he had been reading Luria's work. And he was sort of the first person that, that actually listened and said, um, I think there might be something here in this work that might be a benefit. So he gave me um, some books by Luria, and that's where uh, I saw myself on the page. And, and all of a sudden, things started to make sense that had never made sense before. And I thought, I mean, the first level is, well, someone out there understands what this is. So I realized I'm not totally crazy having this experience. Talk a bit about that. What is it exactly that you discover that... Well, I, I knew that, that I couldn't tell time. I couldn't read uh, a clock. And there was a section in one of the books that I read by Luria, the Russian uh, neuropsychologist, who talked about a specific brain area. And if people had had trauma there, they, they couldn't read clocks. And when I started reading in, in one of his books a description of that area, I thought, this man is describing my life. And then he had a man write a book called, I think it's The Man with a Shattered World, who had had a specific wound to that area. And, and reading, again, this man's description of what he couldn't do, it was, this is my life that he's describing. So I thought, maybe I could create an exercise with clocks. So then I created a whole program um, where I, I drew clocks on paper. And I had to actually sit there with a watch and turn the hands because I couldn't conceptualize that at 2.45, the hour hand would be three quarters of the way through the hour space representing the 45 minutes. Like, I, I couldn't make that kind of connection. Uh, sort of embarrassing to say, but that's the truth of it. So I, I drew all these clocks um, and then thought, okay, if I can get faster and faster at reading them, um, and I would work up to six or seven hours a day until I was totally exhausted, then I'd get up the next day and 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 keep going and it sounds rather simple but it it made a difference in the past if someone came with a learning disability you would try to teach them to work around the weak area so the weak area never got strengthened adjacent areas might get possibly strengthened she isolates the weak area strengthens it so that what happens is people start to spontaneously uh, be able to do um, the activities they couldn't before. You finally opened your school in 1980. Mm -hmm. It was a controversial idea, though. I mean, you ran into some people. Who, I mean, when you first realized maybe this is a way to awaken parts of the brain, it's worked for me. Were you excited? I mean, you you said you're never able to sort of scream eureka as mm -hmm. a young person. Did you? Were you able to I, do it I then? I was very excited. I mean, the first time after doing the exercise that I could watch 60 Minutes, I'm kind of embarrassed to say this now, and actually at the end of it understand what they were saying while they were saying it, um, that was my eureka moment. What did you do? I, uh, I just kind of jumped up and down and shouted. Yeah. And then uh, the fact that I could start reading books and understanding. I mean, I remember there were nights where I was up at, like, I'd wake up at 2 o'clock in the morning and I'd just start pulling books off shelves. And I'd read a page and say, oh, my God, I understand this. And then I'd pull another book thinking, like, maybe it was a fluke, like maybe that was an easy book. I'd pull another book off and understand it. Barbara, I'm really struck 
when I come into this apartment, what are all of these tapes? These are all clinical histories of people that I've worked with that have learning difficulties. So it's, it's people describing their difficulties and then describing the progress that they've made. And some of the upper ones are uh, some of the brain exercises that are auditory. This is extraordinary. I mean, it looks like there's hundreds of tapes here. There are. There are a lot of different this case is the histories. Wall of knowledge. It is. It is. And it's, it's going to be a platform for a book that I'm writing. The other thing I notice when I come in here is for a person who had a really hard time learning how to read, look at all these books. Well, once I started to be able to understand, I became very passionate about reading, and I absolutely love reading. When I visualize your life yeah. as this young, fragile, sad and lonely person with a lot of challenges sandwiched between mm -hmm. two big brothers on one side, two brothers on the other side, and then at either end a brilliant father mm -hmm. and a brilliant mother. Like your father has patented his... He, his I think it's, it's 37 or 40 patents um, for and, uh, um, conditioning electricity. Uh, he was his background's mass in physics, and then he got into engineering without an engineering degree, but became an engineer. He he was uh, he was brilliant. And what was he like at home? Was he always thinking? He was always thinking. He was always um, problem solving, um, and and very busy. I mean, he was I guess when we were growing up a bit of a workaholic. Um, but he'd come home and have his designs out on the floor, and and uh, you know want to explain them to me, and I would sit there and look at them and pretend I understood, but I had no idea what really he was talking about. And then I caught on to his excitement of uh, solving problems and creating things. And your mom was an educator? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, actually, uh, she'd won the Lamp of Learning for uh, Ontario in, in terms of her contributions to education, was on the Board of Education. So in some ways, if I look at my two parents, it's sort of no accident that I ended up doing what I did, given that my father uh, was involved in creating things, and my mother very passionate about learning and, and education. Plus, your mom had an attitude about problems. I guess your parents both had attitudes about mm -hmm. problems, which were? Well, if you've got a problem, you fix it. You know, that, that it was very kind of a no-nonsense driven, um, and, and in some ways, I guess, individualistic. Like, you, you go out and, and you make the world a better place and, and if you're having difficulty you find a solution for the difficulty. Did you ever tell your parents or your brothers how bad it really was? I did um, a number of years ago uh, with my mother and father um, and, and we had some very good conversations about it. And what was the reaction? They were very saddened that they didn't yeah. realize how much pain um, I was Their in. The little girl was in. Yeah. 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 And I mean they saw certain things that they knew uh, didn't make sense, but they didn't. Uh, it was just the tip of the iceberg. Mm. Do you think that they felt that they should have, you know, particularly being so bright, that they should have noticed something? I mean, they, that's what they expressed. Yes, that they they regretted that uh, that they hadn't um, been as aware. And I mean, part of it was the time too. I mean, that there there weren't really solutions at that time, and there wasn't a real understanding of learning disabilities. I know that you spent time with your father before he passed away. Mm -hmm. Did you make it right during that time, do you think, for you? Did you feel that you were more real, that you were more who you really are with your dad? dad? Absolutely. Um, I mean, the last, it was just very special. I loved him with like my whole heart years. and a uh, very wonderful, wonderful man. So yes, I mean, there was nothing that, that we couldn't talk about. and. Uh, we talked a lot about the, the struggles and the difficulties, and, and, and he talked about how sad he was that, um, that he didn't recognize that and couldn't have been there for me in a different way, but he certainly was there for me in the yeah. last years of his life, yes. Here's another difficult thing to talk mm -hmm. about. Um, you got married mm -hmm. to someone who'd been really instrumental in your work. Talk a little bit about him. Um, brilliant individual. Um, he was the person that did introduce me to Luria's work and uh, his background was special education. Um, so it, it, and he was the first person that, that you know, acknowledged that there was uh, reality based to my having learning difficulties. 
Um, so that was that was a bond, and we were both interested in the work, and I think that's really what brought us together. And he was learning disabled as well, um, so we we started the first school uh, together. Then. Um, went to New York in, I think, 85, and were there for a number of years doing this work um, uh, in New York. And then, at, at a certain point, for a number of reasons, decided to go our own separate ways. Um, one of them is I wanted to take this work more out into the world and, and try to get it into other schools and other programs, and, and that wasn't his vision. What did Joshua want to do with the work? Uh, he sort of wanted to keep it more um, just within one center and, and uh, um, reaching fewer people with it and wasn't interested in getting into, say, the, the publicly funded school system. And, and I just felt that that's really, if, if it was possible, where it, it needed to go. It's funny, that's the way friends and family describe how Joshua treated you, mm. that he didn't want you. Uh, he wanted to keep you very close, and he wanted to keep your world quite small. Did you find that? Mm, that's correct. That's correct, yes. And, and, and possibly initially because of, you know, when I got together with him, I did have the learning disability, so it... it I didn't realize that that didn't make sense at the time, and, and as I did the work that I needed to do and, and could start to um, see things differently, I realized that, that there were some significant problems um, in terms of the relationship. Oh, I see. So your perception, in fact, when you met Joshua, you were a different person yes. than when you and Joshua went your separate ways. That's correct. So everybody has a sort of awakening, but you had a completely different awakening. That's correct. Now, when you hear people talk about him, um, they're not very flattering. Mm -hmm. I got to tell you that, and, and it's not just privately; even publicly, he, you know, people are on the mm -hmm. record as saying he was eccentric and that he was enraged and that he was a very difficult person to deal with. Do you think you, in some ways, didn't realize that, that the full extent of that initially, because parts of your brain was asleep or asleep? I think so. I mean, uh, given. The, the nature of the learning disability I had, and also I think probably the self-esteem issues that I had yeah. that went along with that. Um, it, I, I didn't realize that the things that I guess I thought were normal weren't normal. How would you describe what you had known? What kind of a relationship was um, it? Uh, very isolated, which was how I grew up. Mm -hmm. um, uh, very isolated and really working all the time. So it, it, that was my way of, of coping when things were difficult, I'd just put my head down and, and work. Um, so I guess realizing at a certain point that there were was more to life than, than, uh, than just that, and that, that things just weren't right. They, friends of yours have said that they think he was emotionally abusive to you. Do you think that's fair? Um, it's kind of hard to, I guess, talk about it since he's, he's since passed away. Um, but he, he was very difficult. It was very difficult, so it, 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 yes. Out. Mm. Yeah. And, and I think because of um, how I viewed myself, I didn't think that I deserved anything better. It's funny, we never think about this. When we think about somebody having a learning disability, we think about them having difficulty reading. Mm -hmm. We don't think about them having difficulty reading a relationship, mm -hmm. but they do. Oh, absolutely. I used to believe, I think very naively, that, that once the cognitive deficits were dealt with and improved, that all of the emotional overlay would just disappear because now the person can do what they couldn't do. And, and uh, it was kind of a rude awakening that, no, those things just don't go. I mean, if they've, they've lived in one's body for X number of years, um, that has to be re-educated and worked with and, and dealt with. And, and I think there will probably always be that, that voice that, um, uh, you know, that, that I am not capable of certain things. And, uh, you know, and as I said, there still is that little girl that lives in there um, that wonders at times, oh, am I fooling everybody? Here's another painful area to talk about. How about kids? I wasn't able to have children. Um, and that wasn't anything to do with my learning disability, but uh, I have a disease, that endometriosis, which um, led to four miscarriages. Oh, and, gosh. Uh, the How old were you? Uh, I was, I guess, um, I think it was 
about 31 or 32 when it was diagnosed and I had my first surgery. Um, and then I had, I got pregnant four times after that, but as a result of the disease, um, they ended all ended in miscarriage. So it, it was difficult because I would have liked to have had children, but uh, it wasn't meant to be. It's an awful lot on one plate to handle, I think. So where does this come from? The, I can deal with this, uh, it wasn't meant to be. How long did it take you to get to that place? Um, quite a while, I guess probably somewhere in the past five or six years, um, where I think I've, I've just made my peace with a lot of things. How do you feel then when people describe you as a genius, when they point out that the advances in medical science to do with the brain have been relatively rare and that you've pieced together critically important information? How does that make you feel? I guess I discount it. <laughs> I just do. That's I don't right. know what they're talking That's about. That's right. That's right. Um, I mean, I think it's nice that they say yeah. that. And, and, and I guess in some ways, I think, well, maybe it was just luck. Like it was just chance that, that these um, two pieces came together. A lot of your friends say if they could wish anything for you, because you've just given so much from what they can see to them and to the kids you're working with. But if they could give you something, they would like you to have some time off. Mm. They think you work too hard. There's still truth to that, and that's a very ingrained pattern. And I think that's the last thing that, that um, I'm going to say work on, I need to work on. Um, but it is creating balance in my life so that there is more than, than um, just this work. And though I am very committed to this work, I say a prayer every day about putting this work out into the world with ease and grace and heart integrity um, so that it can reach the children that... Uh, it needs to reach.